uh, I sent out to our panelists a document which summarizes some ideas and things I've been thinking about in terms of AI and architecture and what we can discuss. I was just saying before that this has to be considered rather like a, a bunch of friends sitting around in a pub and discussing something they like rather than uh, like a completely uh, inquisitive interrogation of the topic because this is going to happen anyways. Yeah? Um, but uh, let me read to you a couple of lines as introduction from the introductory paper that I sent out to the panelists. Yeah? Um, the panel AI United for Digital Futures 2020 presents itself as an opportunity to survey the emerging field of architecture and artificial intelligence and to reflect on the implications of a world increasingly entangled in questions of agency, culture and ethics of AI. This rapidly developing field of architectural inquiry is ripe for a rigorous interrogation. Almost daily, new practices emerge that focus on the incredible opportunities that an, un that an expanded human mind through AI offers for the discipline of architecture. At the same time, AI is observed with suspicion in regards of potentially displacing entire practices out of the field. The panel oscillates between those poles of tension in order to inform the public audience and the discipline about the status quo and the vision of this paradigm changing new ecology of design. And now I would like to introduce the panelists in a little bit more detail. Um, um, I hope that Ali, uh, Alessandro Shek might join us uh, any minute. Um, Alessandro Shek is a designer and innovator. She's working on the convergence of design, computer science, and exponential technologies. She's bringing in AI and robotics to the forefront of architectural design and construction. The founder of BioThing, an award-winning design laboratory, a partner of Bloom Games, and co-founder of AI Build, Andrashek is professor of design innovation at RMIT, prior to which she directed an award-winning program in advanced architectural design at UCL in London and Wonder Lab Research. Her work has been exhibited at the Centre Pompidou, uh, the New Museum in New York, the Storefront uh, in New York, Storefront for Architecture, I guess, Frag Collection in Orléans, uh, the TBA 21 in Vienna, and Beijing Sydney Binale, among others. And I would actually ask everyone, if possible, to mute their microphones while we are, where they are not speaking in order to avoid background noise. Thank you very much. Uh, Daniel Polochan is an assistant professor focusing on the application of computational design and deep learning strategies in architecture and architectural design processes. Over the years, he has taught several design studios and seminars at the Institute of Structure and Design at the University of Innsbruck. Florida International University in Miami and conducted numerous international workshops and conference workshops dealing with the application of complex systems and neural networks in architectural design. Stanislas Chailu, is that right like that? Chailu? Okay. Yes, you're good. Okay. Uh, Paris native, Stanislas received his undergrad degree in architecture at the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology of Lausanne and his master in architecture from the Harvard Graduate School of Design. Focusing his practice around architecture and artificial intelligence, he believes in the necessary integration of both disciplines to change our built environment. Uh, alphabetically, now I would be, in, uh, so it's Matthias del Campo is a registered architect and designer and associate professor of architecture at the University of Michigan's Taupin College of Architecture and Urban Planning. His obsessive exploration of contemporary moods are fooled by the opulent repertoire of materialization protocols in nature, cutting edge technologies, and philosophical inquiry that together form a comprehensive design ecology. In 2003, he co founded, together with Sandra Manninger, the architectural practice span in Vienna. Immanuel Co is an assistant professor in both the pillars of architecture, sustainable design, and design and artificial intelligence at the Singapore University of Technology and Design where he teaches and conducts research on the creative use of deep learning for architectural and urban designs. Currently, he directs the research laboratory Artificial Architecture in designing and developing new bespoke architectures of AI, AI learning models to solve complex design problems facing the built environment. Neil Leach is an architect, curator, and writer. He's currently a visiting professor at Harvard University GSD, professor at the European, European Graded School, Gao Feng Professor at Tongji University and adjunct professor at the University of Southern California. He has also taught at SIARC, Architectural Association, Columbia, Cornell, at the Dessau Institute of Architecture, IAC, London Consortium, and so on and so on. The list goes on. Um, Sandra Manninger uh, is a registered architect 
and an assistant professor of practice in architecture at the University of Michigan Taupin College of Occupational Planning. She is principal of the Campo Manninger Architects, Spain, I would say, a company she founded together with Matthias del Campo. The practice focuses on the integration of advanced design and building techniques for nature, culture, and technology into a one design ecology. And last but not least, of course, Philippe Morel. Uh, Philippe Morel is an architect and theorist, co-founder of ECCT, Architecture and Design Research, and more recently co-founder and CEO of the large-scale 3D printing company, uh, corporation X3E. He's currently an associate professor at the ENSA, Paris, Paris Malacre, where he leads the digital knowledge program that he co-founded with Christian Girard. He's also the head of the scientific and pedagogical committee of the Advanced Master in Computational Design, Digital Manufacturing and Building Technologies Program at the Ecole des Bonnes Paris, Paris Tech. Previously, Morel was an invited research uh, cluster and MR Diploma Unit Master at the Bartlett, UCL London, and prior to the Bartlett, he taught at the Berlage Institute and the Architectural Association School of Architecture, where he was involved in history and theory study seminars, as well as in the AADRL. And with this, this uh, is our entire panel. Uh, as you can see uh, in a lot of the vitas already, the discussion on AI is present. And I'm very happy that you all are here uh, to discuss together uh, aspects of AI and architecture. And I guess uh, with no further ado, uh, I would also just to stress to our panelists, please, please feel free to share images uh, or ideas or other form of small presentations. You can just share and show things also that are online. Um, maybe to, to illustrate or make your point. I'm gonna just shut down here, this here, okay. Um, and with this, uh, I think we can start our conversation. As I mentioned before, before we started uh, the live stream, this is a conversation that focuses on the, I would rather uh, stress the cultural and symbolic value of AI within the architectural discipline, um, maybe in contrast to other conversations that are talking more about the let's say, um, engineering and uh, optimization problems that can be solved with AI. This one is about how does it actually reflect within the uh, architectural culture at large? How is it positioned within a historical development? This is not the first technology that architecture applies, but it's a uniquely different one. And with this as a provocation, I would like to pass to our panel. Maybe somebody has uh, a starting point for a conversation. Let me just simply say, Matthias, the, we, I've come out of another conversation about AI um, with Antoine Picon and Sanford Quinta and Marika Trotter. And um, uh, so there's, and I hope a lot of people, the group, the group from who are watching that will, will come up with that. So um, there is an ongoing debate, I was to say, that's, that's been, that we're part of. So um, I'll keep quiet for the moment because I think Sanford said some very profound things that left me um, thinking for things, think, still thinking. But one thing I, I mean, I will say that we we mentioned Emmanuel Coe and Stanislav Chilo's work in that in that last discourse. So um, and we haven't seen any of it, but uh, I'd love to see some of their work if there's a chance. Yeah, so while, uh, while we leave Neil processing the last presentation, please, Stanislas, if right. you have anything to say, go ahead. <laughs> sure, sure. Okay. Since Matthias, uh, since you mentioned it's not about engineering, uh, we should not discuss too much the technique, and we should you know go from the technique to the implication and the cultural implications. Uh, but one thing that needs to be said is that uh, when it comes to AI, um, certainly some of the cultural debates we're going to have, the cultural implications stem from the technical reality of AI. So by and large, just to be clear, um, we need to say one thing first, is that AI broadly means using statistical modeling to, to model phenomenon. Um, if we set this as a baseline for the technical realm, for the technical side of things, then, then maybe we understand better what it means culturally, what are the, the cultural implications. So playing with statistics, using statistics to design um, has a profound ontological, um, uh, create a profound ontological change and shift within the cultural realm. Um, and we're not, the first, we're not the first discipline to inherit that debate. Statistics is already in epistemology uh, in exact sciences, something that changed the discourse and the, the path of epistemology. Um, we've seen social sciences being deeply influenced by statistics and the statistical approach in the past. And we're just the next discipline on the menu somehow. 
we suddenly we inherit from those statistical modeling techniques. And after, you know, exact sciences, after social sciences, suddenly we inherit like the last, with the last one in the chain almost. Um, so statistics is the key thing here. It's not just uh, a technical reality, it's also there's some like philosophical underpinnings to the statistical approach that will have, of course, an impact on cultural practices and the way we practice architecture. Uh, one thing then that needs to be said is that to practice using statistics basically shifts the focus from um, the world of heuristics, where I declare the rules of design as an architect, to a world where I observe phenomenon and I derive characteristics and properties from those phenomenon. And therefore, I'm an observer. I observe phenomenon rather than I declare explicitly, declaratively what those phenomena are. That, that thing, going from being a complete author, declaring what truth, what design, what beauty is, to you know, taking a back foot and say, well, I'm going to observe phenomenon and use statistics to uh, induce how a phenomenon works. That, that change is in itself cultural. And therefore, maybe what I wanted to say here is that um, we need to start from statistics. We need to understand the epistemological shifts it implies. Because if we don't do that, then we don't understand culturally what it implies. But I think uh, I want to, to let the place to, to other people to speak. But I think saying that replaces AI within a broader debate. That is not something just that pertains to architecture and to our discipline, but that already happened in science, in social sciences too, and it just arrives in our field at the moment. Anyone who would like to chime in on that? I think apart from the statistical perspective, it's also about the probabilistic perspective, no? Because that, that relates to the many of the generative models that we're using, right? We're sampling probabilistically. First, usually we use like um, <clears throat> normal distribution and those sort of typical statistical distribution, but eventually the generative object or design comes from a very probabilistic uh, approach which leads uh, to the thing that I'm really interested in, which probably news knows about it, this notion of uh, sampling, right? How one could actually sample, it. well, in, in deep learning, basically you sample from this very high dimensional space, which is so abstract, but, but for, for, like for, for music, right? They sample the signals. For, for images, they sample the pixels. For architecture, what, what do we actually sample, right? And then how do we do the remix as well? So I find it quite interesting that it is as much as a statistical uh, approach, but also a very probabilistic one. I mean, the, the sampling example, I'm a bit curious about because if, if you consider the technique of sampling, it, it's always very particular what you select that you sample, yeah? Uh, I don't know if you were talking about sampling in a statistical sense or you were talking about sampling in a, let's say, musical sense, yeah? where you sample something and you, you get something new out of so something that exists. Yeah? In, in, the, in, the, in the AI part, I think what is fascinating is that you can basically uh, digest like the entire history of architecture through AI and you know, go through thousands and thousands of existing plans like Stanislas example is really good for that. Like you can go through this to, through, a, through, a, through massive amounts of plans and train a network to generate something out of that. Actually, there is such a thing as a, sorry, duration coefficient. There's such a thing as a, those guys in computational creativity, they, they talk about this uh, curation coefficient, which, which is basically, the number of uh, worthy generated examples from the number of runs uh, of your system. So when we talk about sampling, of course, there's this curation part to it also, that, that there are ways to measure it. Yeah, Neil, go ahead. Maybe I could just uh, try and um, combine the Stanislaus and, and uh, um, uh, your point in my note. I think the shift, it is, I totally agree with Stanislaus, it's a kind of epistemological shift, and I think it's a fundamental shift in the kind of, the approach to design, it's already been emerging in some domains already. Um, in many ways, we could even question whether the word design is, 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 the pro, is the right terminology. I think we have to develop a new vocabulary for what we're talking about, and maybe sampling is part of that. But it's, to my mind, it's always been a kind of question of, of challenging the old-fashioned top-down demiurgic um, form maker mm -hmm. 
and allowing a process to um, to to happen. So I, I see that kind of the the creativity we get now is it's Delanda first to it is kind of you, you're now you're working with processes and it's almost like you create a search space. Um, you let that algorithm come up with the different sort of options and then you find a way of evaluating or um, uh, yeah, ev evaluating the outcomes in some way, and often that may be aesthetically ju judged and so on. But I think it's important to, to, uh, to connect that with the sampling thing, because I think it is connected. I think the simple um, mm -hmm. example I would give is, you know, just taking a photograph these days. You know, in the old days, there was a photographer who'd very carefully set up this one kind of ideal shot photograph, and maybe take a Polaroid just to get a sense of what it might be like take that photograph and then it'll take a while to develop and so on. Whereas now you kind of take a random sort of a series of sample shots, you know, in your, mm -hmm. you know, and then, then you select out of that the ideal outcome and you might edit it and post it in, in, on your phone or whatever it is. And that's a fundamentally different process. So I think it, I think sampling to my mind is that possibility. And I think what it, the, the point being, I think a lot of people say about AI is it's kind of like it, uh, there are human biases that limit the kind of things that we would think about and it, it opens up the range of possibilities of those samples. Um, but I do think it is a fundamental ep epistemological shift. And I think what Stanislav was saying and what, and what uh, Emmanuel's been saying are actually part of the same kind of shift. And I think maybe, mm -hmm. I'm not sure if sample is the right word, but I think we have to almost develop a new vocabulary for this new territory that we're embarking on. Um, because I think these terms we used to use have been reconfigured. I would. I, I, I would even add that at some point, uh, the artificial intelligence uh, will indicate to the photographer which image is the best one, which image uh, is the one to, to be kept. So in a sense, it's not even in the final decision that the, uh, uh, let's say the authors, authorship decision will lie. Uh, it will be from the very beginning, at the very beginning of the process, that maybe the photographer will decide that he has to take a, a photo or a picture or of such or such an event, such or such uh, a situation or a building. And in, in, in that, I mean, in a sense, it makes everybody, uh, every architect, every artist, uh, becoming a conceptual artist because what remains ultimately is just a decision, you know, because everything else we can consider that whatever happened, it will be made uh, better or uh, more uh, adapted or whatever, uh, thanks to uh, the artificial intelligence. So basically, uh, and I think this is what happens on many, many different levels, you know, like uh, even I mean, the most extreme case, obviously, at the very moment is what happens at the stock exchange. You know, when you do like uh, high, frequency, high frequency trading, uh, there's no way that you can compete with a machine if you want to buy or sell hundreds of thousands of, of shares uh, in infinitely uh, small uh, amounts of time, you know. Uh, so at some point we know that the algorithm are going to to make a decision so what matters is again the conceptual decision at the very beginning which is much more uh, a, a kind of global decision it's much more uh, a, a kind of synthetic vision of the world so it it seems that at the very moment the the, the interesting thing is that uh, we are at the same time uh, on the side of 100% conceptual uh, art, or I would not even say it's only art. I would say that the ultimate job in the future is conceptual. Uh, so we have uh, uh, jobs which are becoming more and more conceptual. And on another level, uh, we are jobs that are also becoming more and more technical because obviously uh, we still need some for example, really good scientists to fine tune the performance of the artificial intelligence uh, tools. So it gives us a feeling that on one side we have uh, hardcore conceptual stuff. On the other one, on the other side, you also have hardcore uh, uh, technical thing, uh, uh, works or jobs or whatever or skills. But in between, there's just nothing anymore. 
maybe maybe to build up on that really good point uh, from Philippe, I think the um, something to consider is that in in the description you just made, there are those technical jobs and those those other things. So the people who are going to belong to the world of concepts, as you as you mentioned, those people are going to have to wonder what are the concepts that that we can't quite that easily convey to the machine. And there are loads of them, uh, as opposed to the stock market, where the, the one metric is money. Architecture is a multidimensional problem. And therefore, when it comes to defining what is good architecture, well, there's so many dimensions that basically new jobs or new, new aspect of the architect of tomorrow will be to be able to um, define those dimensions that aren't that easy to, to uh, communicate to the machine. But simple things. Uh, architecture talks not just about performance, uh, you know, physical performance. It also talks about geopolitics. It also talks about anthropology, sociology. To communicate that to the machine uh, in a supervised uh, fashion, not unsupervised, but let's, let's say supervised fashion is actually quite hard. Encoding the sociological underpinnings of the floor plan is immensely hard. Therefore, that completely changes the mandate of an architect or his or her job. Part of the job of the architect of tomorrow is going to be to be able to encode or to explain to the machine what is the sociological underpinning of a floor plan, what is the demographic underpinning of a floor plan, what are all those dimensions that are quite hard to, to um, dice down into zero and ones. And, and therefore, uh, talking about the cultural implication of AI, it, I'm, I'm pretty sure it means for us tomorrow to expand, instead of shrinking our zone of expertise, as we've done over the past 30 years. It means actually growing our field of expertise to be able to communicate more to the machine. And one thing, one key thing we need to look into is semantics. So the, the structure of meaning and, and, and uh, being able to, to structure meaning and to, to uh, turn to the machine and convey that to the machine is, is a key thing that happened in other technological fields. Um, the web, got structured into a semantic web. And that's for the very good reason that the machine needed more than just zero and ones. They needed a semantic layer. Therefore, a, a piece of expertise that will you know, fall onto the architect is being able to add more semantic meaning to architecture so that we can convey this to the machine. So it just I'm saying this because it, it definitely is a way, uh, a direction for architecture to grow and expand. We're not going to be architect in a traditional sense tomorrow. We will have to take on the shoulder all the dimensions, all the disciplines, all the pieces of expertise. And one is maybe the ability to transform um, floor plans and transform geometries into some kind of semantic content. Yeah, yeah actually, I really, I really agree with that. So, I mean, that there is this, this one part here that it was, it was discussed before the, as an ontological problem, what is happening now with AI and architecture, but of course, at the same yes. time, it's an ep ep epistemological, it's actually an epistemological problem when AI starts to learn a specific semantic meaning of things. I mean, you're completely right. I mean, whoever has been worked a little bit with plants in AI knows that the next question you have is how does an AI understand what is a room, what is a door, what is a wall? And then after that comes the other aspects that you were talking about, which are the social implications within that, that plan. Yeah. So I completely agree that this is really necessary. Just to follow up on that, I think in the end, you know, uh, we are in a position where as architects, probably what we are going to become is we are going to become in a way designers of data sets more than designers of uh, buildings or something. Yeah? And then those uh, data sets are going to be, you know, the information that uh, this kind of AIs are going to provide. And I think this discussion is not only at the level of design, but also when it comes to uh, generating floor plans and uh, documentation and stuff like that. Yeah, like big building information, all those things I think are going to be in the end. You yeah, as an architect, you'll have to actually be a designer of data sets more than, uh, more than uh, a building. And I, I mean, I'm thinking when, when is that analogy with a photographer is, uh, for, for us as an architect, we are also like uh, composing in a way the, the shot. Yeah, it's not that we are just taking the shot. Yeah, so I, I, I imagine in a way that that aspect is actually crucial and it's going to have a, su a huge implication in the way that we are going to see uh, architecture. And also, I think it's also it's still leaving open for ar architects the idea of we are not only going to get information that was already built, uh, like you know, images of. Uh, existing buildings and from there we are going to generate something but i think we still have as architects we still can generate in a way our own models that the ai then expands on yeah 
So uh, I think uh, we have to also look at this aspect. Right now, architecture actually went through this kind of like uh, generative phase and adding a lot of generative design strategies in. And uh, we should go, uh, we should not stop with architecture just at the level of uh, images, probably, yeah, where you're just learning semantic information. Uh, so, yeah, I, I think, yeah, for me personally, the way I see it is mostly, you know, I see architects as designers of data sets in the end more than anything else. I, get, I mean, I think I completely agree, Daniel. Um, maybe even we need to think about architects as maybe information architects rather than form architects and from that point perspective. The only thing that I would, I would raise as a kind of question, it's, um, I was in a discussion with, with Hovart Hochland before uh, um, from Spacemaker. Um, and, and I guess that, that, that we, there are two debates, whether, whether we're going to end up with this kind of hyper-technological sort of super users, um, uh, as, as Randy Deutsch has called them, I mean, kind of like, a, like a specialist modeling group kind of really informed architects, uh, Zaha Deep Code, you know, or whether in fact AI is going to make life incredibly easy for us. I mean, if you, I mean let's take something like a, an ordinary cell phone, you no know, facial recognition, which of course is very, very difficult to make work, but it makes life easier. You know, you just hold it up and your phone and you, it opens up and so on. So I think we have a kind of, a, 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 there, are, there are kind of a, a multiplicity of different responses. One is in which actually it becomes super easy, um, much easier, and then there's this very refined technological sort of architect who will be um, driving the process in some ways. If you, if you consider, if you consider uh, the smartphone as an example with uh, facial recognition, then you need to ask yourself, are you, are you the customer or the architect? Because in the smartphone example, at some point, the, the, the customer uh, is the one who, uh, who had his life made easy. So uh, then in that case, it means that maybe the architect would be the customer of really advanced artificial intelligence tools that, mo that might be created by, some, by other people, uh, maybe like big, uh, 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 big software companies like Autodesk or Dassault System or whatever. Uh, so I, I'm not really sure. Uh, my, my feeling is that uh, I, I have the feeling that there are some other parameters uh, also that are super important for architecture, which makes the discipline of architecture different from some other domains where uh, AI is widely uh, used. The fact is that if you consider a, an autonomous car, uh, an autonomous car is producing producing something like 11 uh, terabytes of data per day, you know. But architecture is not producing anything. I mean, once, once a building is, is built, there's very few data that you really need to collect. And in fact, the data that needs to be collected, uh, they are collected by Google, you know, or Amazon with Alexa or Google Home or this kind of, of uh, 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 apparatus. So at some point, architecture remain a very, very, very basic and traditional domain when you consider it, because it's not dynamic. I mean, I mean, in fact, even uh, uh, Stanislas says that it might be complex to, uh, to give the right semantics to plants and sections and, and different rooms. Uh, Personally, I'm not so sure. Person, I mean, I'm not saying that it's easy, but I'm, I mean that compared to, to the amount or to the difficulties that, uh, uh, which is represented by autonomous cars in terms of techni technological uh, 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 skills and algorithmic skills uh, and the level of artificial intelligence, I think there's nothing to compare. I mean, architecture is a very, very, very primitive discipline compared to, uh, to autonomous cars or autonomous planes, you know? So this is why I'm not totally sure that uh, we should completely uh, 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 avoid speaking about, about the, the, the static versus the dynamics, uh, that we can also avoid speaking about the quantity of data that we collect or that we need. And again, for all of that, architecture is a primitive domain. 
But I think soon if we are, if we are looking at uh, architecture and AI and we are looking in the uh, broader context of big data and uh, uh, Internet of Things and everything, uh, we can easily uh, make this assumption that soon every single uh, architectural element is going to be associated with a uh, uh, with the data, uh, like uh, driven like technology or something that collects data. And I think soon in a way we'll have buildings that actually, yeah, are this kind of huge brains that are collecting everything about uh, doors that are opening and where users are and uh, what kind of activities are happening. And I think that kind of wealth of information, I, I think that will be uh, the, the most crucial thing and, uh, to have to input in our AIs, you know. I mean, Google, they, they use this kind of, uh, they use this kind of idea to uh, to optimize their uh, their um, uh, energy use uh, in their uh, centers. So that's a very you know very ba basic idea. But I would imagine a uh, similar thing happening then with architecture is, is everything starts to be associated with that. Um, almost like every single element in architecture is broadcasting. You know. So, but what if we if we don't? But, but what if we don't think about it like in plans and sections? But how to ever uh, does Airbnb evaluate? You know, and how they do get data? So they have a lot of information about these places. So you're making a decision based on the information that you've been giving there. So I think these kind of models uh, are probably more towards how we might be living in the future than having a, a home for two or three or four generations you know so i think that's 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 something uh, also uh, the second point i would like to make is uh this also as architects we're not only digesting and uh, uh retrieving information but we're also generating information you know so we are living in these buildings that's something that uh that also possibly needs our expertise you know to to be able to evaluate these data sets then that are the probably then generated because it doesn't mean that if you have the perfect plan, you have the perfect living unit. I think that's something that will change a lot. Think about the, uh, the perfect plans they had in the 30s, the perfect plans and sections, you know, Mies van der Rohe developed. That's, some, that's a model that we would not suggest anymore, although it's evaluated, you know, so, so we appreciate it and we have good data sets about it, but it's not perfect because society has changed. So I think that's also something we can provide. We have a body. That's something that the artificial uh, intelligence will be not able to create very quickly. So that's something we have, we have this, we have much more sensors and more sensible sensors than the data we can produce right now. Mm -hmm. I would like okay. to add to this a little bit. Uh, um, Picking up on Sandra's point, too, you, you need to. Def I think you need to first see on the bigger picture and say, let's say, AI is basically part of the whole automation tendency that we see in the entire world and in all the areas that are out there in terms of production and making and so on. So it also means that it's part of a consideration that is social and political, and there is like a, a whole set of things that need to be considered once AI becomes part of architecture production. The second part is. I think you need to differentiate where AI is involved in the in the discipline of architecture. Yes. Uh, you can take the, the planning part, you can take, take the construction part, and you can take the life cycle of the building. And all those three things are actually generating data in a variety of ways, in, in different ways. Yeah. If you go into construction and say AI is part of the automation, it means that you are basically, I've seen already like the start of applications where a, there is AI, control, basically there is, uh, an idea: How do you con how do you control construction workers on the construction side using facial recognition and neural networks in order to optimize the construction uh, of the building? Which then goes back into these ideas, for example, of James Bridal about the meat algorithm, where suddenly construction workers just become part of the fulfillment of a specific idea that an, that an AI is generating in terms of optimizing the construction of a building. So there's like a whole set of very complex aspects in this whole. Uh, let's say, ecology of thinking about AI and architecture. Yeah, can I maybe just add to that? I think, you know, I, I, I don't think that the life, we need to think about the building once it's built as, ha as, as having a life of its own, being activated by users. And also the question about environmental performance becomes kind of crucial and how AI can feed into that. Um, but I think another factor that's become increasingly apparent um, just recently is the fact that now we're living in spaces where our homes become offices. Uh, and uh, in the sense that in terms of uh, uh, the kind of programs uh, already uh, shifting and changing. And I think the, 
the capacity is there for a kind of more interactive approach towards it, um, uh, in the internal modeling of a building that needs to deal with this kind of uh, mutating condition in which we find ourselves. So I, mean, I think that um, I think there's, there's, a, there's a huge kind of afterlife, as it were, after the building is constructed, which I think is going to become increasingly important. And I think the idea of that we're living in a kind of uh, an ambient environment in which computation is, is embedded within that environment and can potentially be responding intelligently to how we're operating. Uh, and I see it as, as, as that's a, as an extension of, 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 of what we understand as architecture. Uh, Neil, just one point to that. It's, it's a really, really good point and really ties back to what AI precisely is. The notion that AI is in one of its uh, capacity able to do predictions suddenly pushes us architects um, or enables us to finally be able to assess whether the building is going to perform in the future and in the state of operation once the building is delivered. In the past, we used to carry on our shoulder this, uh, in what we call in France, this annal, meaning we're, we're responsible for the building for 10 years, but we had no idea beyond our own craft whether that building would perform well in the future with AI. And if we train it well, if we do the work thoroughly, we might have a shot at understanding the performance in the long run and therefore projecting ourselves, our expertise and our responsibility, which basically means our contribution to society way beyond what's, what we're doing today. Today, we're only delivering a building. And by the way, over the past 30 years, more and more architects have pulled out of the operation phase and refused to sign the decennial, this 10-year um, phase of responsibility. A lot of architects became design architects and said, well, I'm not going to be contracting or anything. I'm going to you know, step back from the construction phase. If we have the ability to construct better and also to forecast, and insist on this word, forecast, because that's one of the things AI does well, prediction. If we can predict the performance of the building, then maybe we can reclaim some of our expertise, some of our relevance in society, and contribute in a much more relevant fashion. So to the point that was made before, the point that um, buildings are in fact very simple, simple artifacts, simple things, way simpler than autonomous cars. Um, we, we can make this claim today because we, we pull out uh, in the past. We, we've disengaged ourselves from the hard part of the job, the one that is to carry the, the expertise, that is to carry the responsibility on the shoulders. We might have a shot today. I actually, at, at going back in there and actually getting this back, uh, it, it's, it is a clear tendency of architecture that you know, it has, has turned back the expertise on the shoulder of the engineer or the contractor. We might be able to actually bring this back home and, and suddenly grow in relevance so it's, it's not to be, I think, neglected because it's a key thing here. I mean, just I to say, maybe I have... think, Yeah, just one thing. I, I think that, that, that uh, uh, Ben Bratton actually laid some of these things, things out um, uh, mm -hmm. in his fabulous article he did in Digital Cities. You know, we were, this was, came out in 2009 and um, everyone was saying, well, what is the form? What's going to look like? Is it going to be a parametric city and so on? And actually what ben, ben Bratton said, well, actually, we need to, half of architects need to stop making new forms and become kind of information architects working with software and thinking about how we can reuse the forms that we have already. And I think that's a, a crucial kind of a, a, a opening in terms of, of what we do. I, my favorite information architect is someone called Shan He. Shan was at uh, um, MIT, uh, she was at MIT, and then she went to work with, with Uber initially to kind of to be mapping things out and developing our own software to understand how the city operates. And I think that really is a, a kind of a, a potential kind of a opening for architects. And I think we need to reinvent ourselves in many different sort of ways, but especially opening up to that possibility of engaging with AI um, as, as a kind of tool to understand how the city operates. And, yeah, I'll just continue what Thanks was saying. It's like, I think this aspect of uh, selling being required in a way to uh, to prove that uh, your assumptions as an architect are also, are also going to perform after the building gets built. I think they are going to have huge implications for architects because right now, like you are saying, since last, we kind of retreated a bit. Yeah, we 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 gave up responsibility in a way not to. Uh, yeah because of these uh, fears and many times like we are what we are doing is like we are also making very big claims and then they don't materialize and i think it's already like i think in uk we already start to to ask for this kind of uh performance in a way uh evaluations and uh, uh you you have a certain fee that it's uh retained from you so you cannot uh, only if the building performs well then get that fee yeah so i think i think it's going to be a 
something that's going to really shape a lot, you know, uh, the way that we are, we as architects are going to, um, to, uh, yeah, be practitioners, yeah. Because everything that we are going to, uh, to say has to be uh, proven by data in the end, has to be proven that actually that thing really operates like that and it's going to perform like that. I have a question in regards of, of that last statement. There's a really interesting point in Manuel de Landa when he discusses the difference between symbolic culture and material culture and the ways how computational design actually interacts between these two. And I would, I would be interested into the position where, uh, I mean, most definitely AI is a completely symbolic driven technique. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's so much about uh, the meaning of imagery, for example, and the interpretation of imagery through a specific, uh, through a specific algorithmic design. Yeah. Uh, how does that, that very, um, uh, let's say, sim simple driven idea contribute to material culture? Or how do you envision how it will contribute to material culture? Meaning, what are the material artifacts that come out of it? Right now, we don't have many buildings that are based on this. I mean, it's a very new development, I, I give you that. But do you envision how that will contribute? Uh, maybe just one thing. Um, maybe one addendum to the question is that um, I think I think we're looking for that very much because the last revolution, so to say, parametricism was very much tangible, very much legible in the shapes. You look at the Hadid's building and you can see right there the parameters fluctuating through space. You can see the, the, the physical materialization of a technique on an architecture. The thing with AI is that it, it it has the ability to happen at a way more semantic level, way more meaningful level. Therefore, it's going to be embedded way deeper in the forms and, and the architecture itself. Therefore, the consequence of this means it won't be as legible, it won't be as obvious as parametricism. So even if today we are looking at new buildings and we're looking for AI, AI style or its, its own shape, the same way we looked at parametricism and we were looking for those parameters to fluctuate, well, this time it's not as legible because it touches to the core of architecture, to the meaning of it, to its semantic um, layer. And therefore, um, even though we don't see it today, a lot of buildings today are being you know, shaped by AI in the sense that a lot of models are being used to generate world floor plans, world you know, sections, world 3D geometries, or even used to forecast the performance. So that's the thing. We, we won't see maybe as fast and in as a tangible fashion things tomorrow, um, but that is in itself kind of the, the result or the symbol of AI's success is that it has, the, it has managed to reach the discipline at a fundamental level. Therefore, we can still have our own architectural style and do things that resemble architecture, but informed at a way more fundamental level by AI. I mean, what, one of the cooler thing about this whole technique is basically that you can train an AI to emulate your own sensibility by training it on your own imagery. Like the one things that you have generated over the time. So I think that's a really interesting problem because it, it somehow, it, it's still going to look different than what you would design manually, so to speak. Yeah. But there are remains of that. And I've seen this a lot in work that I've done with, with students and in our own work, that it's actually possible to train an AI to to play along a specific uh, aesthetic value, so to speak. Yeah, But I, I like what you said about the, 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 the recognizability. Like, for example, each one who uses the technique with its own data set will generate a different result, right? And I think that that is really exciting. Okay. Here, I think, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. So here, I think it's also, we, we have to bring in the discussion, the idea of how we evaluate those results. Yes, yes, AI is going to create some artifacts, but how do we know that actually those are good or not? Because we are so limited by our yeah. own perceptions and what we believe that's actually good or bad, yeah. That's a good so question. That's open like a huge discussion, like, uh, you know. Let, let me tell you one story about, let me tell you yeah. a story about that. Or you want to say that, Sandra, about no, no, I just just brought just one sentence. I mean, we have to design a huge feature space. So I'm, 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 I'm really, who is going to tangle that? So uh, just a quick story. Last semester, I had a group of students who were developing an artificial art critic. Yeah, so who could actually say what's a good piece of art and what's a bad piece of art. 
And I was really immediately like, oh, I don't think that's a good idea. But they went, they went through with it. Yeah? And it's quite interesting that the results are quite, in, quite, you know, I mean, if you see what the AI said, it's a good piece of art, it was like, yeah, it's just not that bad. So, I mean, there must be something there that, that the sort of, if you take this, and what they did was basically they took the stance of one specific art critic. So it was not an art critic in general. They took one specific art critic and basically tried to emulate the judgment method of that art critic in a neural network. Yeah, I'm not sure if, they, if this art critic would at the end also do the same assessment that the students did, but nonetheless, you had a tool that did assessments. Well, but isn't so that every single, every single damn that's happening, right? As a generator and as a critic. So it's, it's kind of, it's always already there. But one thing I just want, I wanted to throw th a couple, three thoughts out that came out of a discussion I, that's going to be broadcast fairly soon with, with Harbour Hawkland and, and Wan Yu He. First of all, I think we know we, it's very, we should be careful not to just talk about AI and more talk about extended intelligence because at the moment at any rate we're in a situation where it's become a prosthetic um, device that is there that becomes an extension in some ways um, of the architect. Actually one of the comments I like very much um, by Michael Hansmeier is the idea that actually it becomes a kind of muse. You know it's throwing up these possibilities that, it, that in some ways make, makes us more human um, by opening up those kind of questions. So I think we, we to just talk about AI on its own is, is kind of a bit of a it would actually, there's always a human involved in that, you know. Um, um, anyway, never mind. The two other comments I wanted to throw out there, um, uh, and one is that, you know, I think in terms of how things are going to shifting um, and how we'll be changing the future, another comment that comes out from Hova was to say that um, very soon architects who use AI will replace those who don't use AI. So it's going to get a fundamental kind of um, kind of base terrain on which we're operating, we will have to use AI. And, and then another one, a final comment I want to throw in there, is that is that, that increasingly what, they're, what, what they're, they're discovering now is that clients are demanding that architects use space maker or other AI tools uh, because they precisely can be much more rational, logical, and I assume, the, I assume optimize the site and so on and so on and so on. So there are a lot of kind of shifts that are happening. Um, but I think we need to talk about uh, extended intelligence rather than simply AI on its own. It, it, the problem is that um, it doesn't necessarily, I mean, you can have, a, you can have plans and, and dwellings and so many things like that that could be optimized by AI. But nevertheless, you, it's no guarantee that, this, uh, that the architecture produced is a good one. You know, I mean, uh, Matthias, Matthias took the example of the art critic, but obviously just imagine the art critic that, that would be trained uh, before, uh, before Marcel Duchamp, you know. Uh, so obviously, obviously the art critic would consider good art that maybe something that would be more or less a traditional painting. Uh, or maybe if the art critic is is already a bit more radical, he would consider good art. Uh, uh, he would consider cubism and futurism as good art. But obviously, when Duchamp is producing the urinal, you know, uh, this wouldn't be considered that art by the artificial intelligence because the artificial intelligence would have been trained uh, on a set oh. of parameters that would that would have been completely uh, uh, incapable of recognizing the invention of conceptual art by Duchamp. So ultimately, I think, and, and you know, I think that what AI is capable of doing today, uh, it's a kind of weird because it's something which is ex excessively traditional because it's mostly predicting the future based on some past experiences. So ultimately, it's a very, it, I mean, politically speaking, we would, we would call this conservatism, you know, mm -hmm. yeah, sure. I think the system, you, you, uh, the example that you're providing, Philippe, that's something that would be evaluated from the AI. So you're not only making predictions, you're also testing the accuracy of your model. So if your da data would change so dramatically from, from I don't know, from Monet to Duchamp, to Duchamp uh, this, uh, uh, that there are, uh, the system has to monitor itself that the data is not relevant anymore and the model fits not anymore. So either by a human or probably later by an, by an AI itself, it would, uh, uh, it would also uh, check and recognize 
that its model is not not, not uh, 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 evaluating the data provided data sets in in in, in an uh, suitable fashion. So it would either change some loss functions or probably would uh, change uh, some model architecture totally differently. Uh, probably from linear, going from linear. Well, I think to in the end you you have to. So, you have to design the objective function, isn't it? Like if I have an objective function that could figure out what's a good Duchamp or a bad Duchamp, then I, I could do it, right? With the same uh, machine learning model. But then the, I completely, so going back to maybe Neil's question, like AI user will replace the non-AI user using architect, I suppose. But I don't think it's about using, you know? It's, it's one thing to use a phone, it's quite a different thing to design a phone, right? So I think, Maybe in the extreme case, I have I met colleagues who are like they are interested in AI, but they don't want to touch the neural networks. They don't want to know exactly the layers, the objective function. They just don't care. They just want to use it, which probably goes well with you know more more simple stuff. But if you want to get really serious about it, then in the end you have to talk about more really technical stuff. Yeah. Maybe so I, I think the AI in, uh, model, those who model the architecture, neural network architecture, would, would in that sense, replace a non-AI user. If that's by, by, by the way, Emmanuel, just so you understand, my resistance to discuss only technical things in this round is because I assume everyone in this round is aware of those technical problems, so yeah. we can go our next step. Please, Stanislas. No, I, th I think... Um, just to, to build on what Philip has said, because I think Philip writes the exact point is that uh, art is a perfect example, poesy is another one, is that at that moment in history, paradigm shift happens. And um, if, if AI models learn about the past and we can still build, you know, loss functions and objective functions and wait for them to assess the quality of their prediction, they can't forecast paradigm shifts. Um, that, that's what is the base of, uh, you know, uh, the history of art when a movement replaces another one no one could have really forecasted your arrival of one movement against another just by looking at the past. Um, and therefore, when it goes back to agency and how we use AI for tomorrow, um, it simply means we need to assume that AI is just a part of the toolkit. It remains toolkit. It won't never replace the actual intuition because it doesn't have the ability to actually uh, give an accuracy metric to paradigm shifts or to create in itself a paradigm shift. Um, mm -hmm. Can I just th throw something out there, Stanislav, as a provocation in some ways, and also a provocation to what Philippe was saying, what happens if um, what AI, AI doesn't produce good architecture? Um, and there's a comment by Alan Turing about, you know, he's predicting the possibility of AI being able to compose sonnets. But then he makes this comment, but maybe only AI would be able to appreciate those sonnets. I mean, he used the word machines, right? Now that's, that's interesting, right? Because I think what we're, we, we have a way too human-centric way of thinking about these things. And, and I certainly know that with Spacemaker, there have been occasions when AI has produced suggestions um, for you know, urban, urban planning suggestions that are counterintuitive to how an architect might think. Um, and actually, but they've been proved to be, be very effective. They, 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 within our kind of our very limited mindset, we haven't been able to imagine those things. And that goes back in a way to echoes that the issue that happened, the, this, uh, to my mind, the kind of, very fundamental moment in the history of AI, a move 37 in game two of AlphaGo versus Lee Sedol. When this, the computer, um, AlphaGo produces this incredible move that everybody's kind of laughing at and saying, what a stupid move, you know, that's a, that's a dumb move. Um, mm -hmm. And after a while, people begin to realize, no, it's not a dumb move. It's one of the most intelligent moves ever made. And it's kind of thinking several moves ahead. And what happened as a result of that is the whole game of Go changed. We've got a fundamentally different game of Go. It, it, it's changed things uh, completely. You know, so that my suggestion is going to be actually we need to let go in some sense of, of this view about you know, is AI up to human standards and actually to accept the fact that actually it might take the discourse of architecture into new and very interesting directions that we hadn't previously, pre previously imagined. And so of course, that, uh... Neil, sorry to interrupt you, but we, we're in the last minutes of the one hour we have. We're gonna go ahead. Yeah, yeah, but just, just, just to be, you know, a little, little bit disciplined here. So, uh, the, the, because the conversation, the conversation, uh, like the post-human conversation on the impact on architecture, that's like a whole hour more that we need to discuss this because it's a really, really good and really long topic. And I agree with you. That's a great topic. Yeah. But we've got an hour left, Matthias. We have to, uh, two hours for this slot. So, I mean, I, I just think that it's, it's an interesting kind of issue, you know, and, I, and in a sense, 
the real key question that we, we, we face actually is as AI gets more and more intelligent, whether we're even going to recognize that intelligence because it would be so far beyond us. You know, yeah, you, you, dude, I have, Sandra and I wrote it, a paper like two years ago about the topic. I'm happy to send it to you. But isn't, isn't it in a way that uh, the way that we are looking right now at the problem is, uh, it's almost like we, we're, when we say AI, it's almost like we are imagining one single AI. But I think what actually we are going to have, we are going to have actually multiple AIs, like uh, probably each architect is going to have its own AI. And then also this problem of the critic, if it's identifying correctly paradigm shifts or something. Personally, I imagine it, it will be able to do that if uh, actually we don't talk about one single AI. If we talk about multiple AIs with multiple inputs with different experiences, more, uh, different users, yeah, you have different architects with different backgrounds, different ways of using their AIs. Their AIs are interacting with other architects AI. Probably that kind of frame actually will actually be more, more plausible than just thinking of AI as one single thing. You know? No, this is entirely true. I think actually that that is also a little bit in the outline I said to you, the problem that AI is an extremely generalist term and that actually there's, it's actually just like an umbrella upon a bunch of different ideas and techniques that are getting uh, currently distributed. But of course, I mean, one thing I would like to come back to, and I think that would be like two things that are really, I think, good for this conversation. Number one, uh, there was the first is mentioning about the problem of agency and and uh, authorship and shared authorship, which I think is a super interesting problem when suddenly we start to understand that the human is not on the top of the pyramid of creation in terms of design, but rather starts to have a, where there's like a plateau where we are sharing actually agency with a variety of different agents. And it doesn't mean that they overturn us, but that they become partners within the process of creation. Uh, somebody mentioned the term muse, which I thought was, a, was an interesting, was this, was that, uh, study, uh, was this uh, Emmanuel, I think? It's, it's, was, okay, it was Neil? Michael Heinzmeier, yeah. he's used it. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so, so basically that actually is aligned with certain ideas that are currently out there, like what AI can contribute to not only architecture, but I think creative work in general. I mean, there's like entire areas also using AI to create books or paintings and so on. I'm just yeah. thinking about that one painting from the Paris-based Obvious, uh, Bellamy, that was self sold recently for what, $425,000, I think, at Christie's which already is showing that there is an evaluation of agency or, or putting value in something that was not created completely humanly, but actually in a collaboration. Because the question, for example, in the painting is, who is the author here? The algorithm, the art collective, or the person who did the algorithm? Yeah? It's a question of copyright. Actually, it's much more complex. That, sorry, the, just the, and the work that you're mentioning by the, the Parisian group, so actually, they, 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 they teenagers to get the, the, the money, right? The, because they took the code from, from him, Barrett. So it really complicate the agency, now they're talking about it, right? Because it is, in fact, drawn from multiplicity of, of uh, from the code point of view, even. Yeah, go on, Neil. No, I, I think it's a, it's a question of, of, of copyright, absolutely. No, I think, but I think, I don't think the obvious thing to me, actually, I find it kind of boring because that's just simply trying to use AI to replicate what humans do. And that's precisely the problem. You know, I think if, if you think more about people like Refik Anadol, the way they're working AI uh, and producing installations and, and, and so on, not constrained by all the formats, you know, the old fashioned formats, but opening up a new domain of experimentation. That's what I'm suggesting. I think, you know, we will find architecture enriched and, and, and diversified and exploring new terrains as a result of AI. And that narrow view that we have already is only going to constrain us. We need to be open up in new ways. That's a great uh, response, but it was not a question. Anyways, uh, Stanislas, please. <laughs> no, no, but, no, but to, to, to Neil's point, um, if we say that an AI is performing better, or even in when we claim that an AI has done something counterintuitive, we still measure the quality of the result uh, along dimensions that we have defined as humans. So uh, that notion that a machine could take a counterintuitive path and yet achieve quality still means that it performs with respect to human-defined dimensions and criteria. So, even in the claim that sometimes we should let the machine you know, rumble on because it will ultimately perform, even there, it still rumbles on within the set boundaries of our own rules, of our own dimensions. Um, so the machine will, is not dethroning, is not 
um, you know, taking the top of the pyramid all of a sudden. Not at all. Actually, it's not, it's just a fancier tool that is behind us, below us, and does more fancy things than the thing that the tools we had before. Um, so I, th I, think it's, I think it's a key belief, uh, especially if we want to keep the humanist uh, you know, um, tradition in architecture to say that, well, the human is still at the top of the pyramid. It has you know, suddenly access to a fancier tool, something that does better things, but he or she still designs the dimensions against which we judge the performance of that one tool. Do you see my point now? Yeah, I, I just, but I do think, I mean, one thing I wrote in this Harvard Journal just recently, I, I use the term second Copernican revolution, you know, and I think we have this problem of putting human beings at the center of everything. We've got to realize actually there's a whole universe out there and we shouldn't just judge things by human standards and we need to kind of relinquish that role to open up the possibilities of new ways of thinking that may take us further forward. Yeah, I mean, that, yeah, I, mean that's I agree, but the question is still, are we still playing the game of go or do you suggest that we should get rid of the game of at all and let the AI design a better game of go or what are yeah. your suggestions where we set the boundaries? <laughs> well, you know, famously, that's exactly what AI is, is, you know, it's making, it's defining boundaries. Uh, well, I don't know about that, um, but I, I think I have to say Lisa Doll gave up <laughs> playing Go. Mm -hmm. Uh, he said, "This is an entity that can't be uh, can't be defeated." But I know I think we we need to sort of just kind of like a, I, I guess step beyond our, our, our. We've always done judged architecture in human terms from the Renaissance onwards. We judge buildings in terms of proportions and relationship to humans and so on. But I just think that there's there's a new space out there of creativity and imagination that we have to be open for, which requires relinquishing some of those preconceived ideals about what architecture should be. I think pretty but, much but everyone Neil, in this round is Neil probably I, I probably have to disagree because I, I was trained in a more engineering school uh, mm -hmm. when I was 14 and none of the buildings that I've learned about then was really about architecture. It was really just about comfort and uh, a mechanism. So we were not discussing uh, classic architecture, but we were actually discuss, uh, discussing more the profane architecture like farmers buildings or something like that so our criteria would have been to have enough heat for the for the living spaces of the farmers then so you would have the stall of the cows below to to heat up so, so that those were the criteria that established in my mind when i was becoming about so it was nothing about proportion it was nothing about classical theory so I think that's that's that. I think uh, just because you uh, we think now we can have a better performance for our building doesn't mean that performance was never a product that also should be uh, considered when producing architecture. There's nothing uh, there's nothing bad we did before that before AI came. I think okay. it's really just the same set of questions you set yourself. And then you have to really disrupt the industry in its, in, in its entirety, you know, in its fabrication, in its getting matter and material to work. So I think there's, there's a lot of, of things that uh, are not possible in a small office. And now with, with AI, there obviously is opening a door to keep track of all these changes. You know, just to, to clarify, I mean, I'm not necessarily talking about proportions, the Renaissance and so on, you know, although that was my background. What I'm trying to say, we continue that legacy. We're continually judging AI on our terms and we need to relinquish that, you know, and I, but I'm, I, I'm, I, you're lucky to have that experience. I was a student at the University of Cambridge. The engineering school was right behind the School of Architecture and there's absolutely no discourse going on between those two. So it's, it's good that they're embracing that. But I do think that there's, there's more out there that's going to surprise us in a way you know about what architecture could be if only we open up to that thing and don't constrain it to our, our existing paradigm well I, I think that's a matter of education as both sandra and you actually alluded to now and and talking to this round here like the majority of people here if not all of us i think all of us are actually educators yeah so it's actually our job to disrupt that notion that is ex exists in architecture. And to be honest, that has been a job for the last 20 years already, because we have been trying to get rid of that romantic notion of the architect as the sole genius for the last 30, 40 years already. And it's not going away that easily, yeah, because people love that romantic idea of the genius with the sketch pad and doing like a little sketch on a napkin and then building something with that. People imagine steel architecture to be like that, yeah? So, but, but, but hold on a second, Matthias. I think, I think actually in some ways, 
we've sort of been deluding ourselves often when we're working computationally. And this is my comment from the paper in Lacadia two years ago. And that is to say, we are not yet digital. You know, what tends to happen, we, uh, people say, oh, it's been generated by the computer, which kind of lends a certain sort of uh, authority to what's been come out. But then really what we're doing, we're writing code. And if it doesn't come out to be what it wants to be, then we rewrite that code. I love this comment once that um, Nick Piska made to, to, to Roland, Roland Snooks, who gave this, I mean, of course, his works, Roland's work's amazing, but Roland, uh, uh, Nick Piska said to him, what happened if you wrote, if you wrote some code and it produced the Farnsworth house? I mean, it was a fabulous <laughs> question. And, and Roland's comment was, oh, that would be an unfortunate outcome by which I assume he would go back and tweak the code until it didn't look like, like the Farnsworth house. Look, so I don't think he actually, I think that's part of the problem. We're still trying to control it in a way so it fits our view of the world. Yeah, to, to keep it short, uh, Peter Eisenman actually once famously said, if I don't like it, I change it. Yeah, so that's like in short what we were trying to say. And, and to be honest, I mean, I don't think this is wrong. Yeah, uh, uh, I, let me tell you one little story about computational design, which comes from another field. Sandra will, I think, confirm that. There was a time when you were saying you're doing electronic music, people were saying, ah, you, pu you, put a, you push a button and then you have a piece of music, yeah? And that's what a lot of people think about computational design too. There is like the, not the insight how much actually information, knowledge and, and experience and sensibility has to go also into a computational project. There is no, I mean, still, for example, even using all these techniques that we know now, no matter if it's parametric design or AI or anything, there's still this moment where you get something out of the computer and you, and you are sitting in front of the screen and saying, can I do something with it or not? There's still this decision moment. And everyone who says different is probably gonna lie. Yeah, and at the moment I have to uh, tell you also, uh, for us, uh, 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 an AI model is not so successful if it produces something that we already projected, you know? So for us, this would be a discriminating moment. So for us, yeah. it is important that we change the model that it produces something that we would have never come up with. And even if we don't like it, you know, so it's, it's even better because it really makes us try to understand, okay, what was happening now, what is going on there, and is this, uh, should we change our sensibilities? Yeah, and also, also something um, that is quite, quite nice here is that um, to the point that was made before about sampling, um, and to Neil's point, Neil, you were saying, uh, if I don't like what I see, I'll recode the code. Well, with AI, was one thing that's interesting is that you bring back the notion of serendipity in the design process. Um, you know, uh, there's this philosopher, Bertsley, who brought that up. Uh, um, in his theory, creativity was, in, like, intricately was stochastic, meaning I go from one decision, then at, at a given decision, I look at a hundred options. Stochastically, I decide, well, this one is better. Then I go to another decision, and then I look at another distribution, choose something, and move on. So in Bursley's idea, I think the, 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 the Bursley ideal is kind of brought back here where instead of recoding the code when you don't like, you just either sample again or choose something else in the distribution. So in the dream of AI or the hope of AI is not to have to recode everything every time, is that once you have a distribution model, hopefully you can sample it again if you want something better. You don't need to, at least that's the ideal thing. You don't need to retrain everything. Hopefully, if the training isn't well, it's a matter of resampling or choosing again in the distribution rather than coding or retraining again. Yeah. Do, do you see the point? So are we make? still start with the human curator then? I mean, in the, in the end, as much as we want to descend or relinquish the, the descend oh, the human, but in the end, we have to, the humans still have to judge. Or like, new, do you have an answer? So if, if imagine you are in the studio create, right? So the, the jury, they are all like, say, AI, who are going to judge the work. Without the human, it's almost because we're stuck with our biological body, this just, we just can't get out of it. So it, I think it's kind of a, a kind of an irony to say that we want to completely remove that human figure. Um, there's, there's another point to that, actually, that until, until recently, the idea was that pattern recognition with computational tools is very difficult. But now, of course, through the development of the last maybe two years, that is not that true anymore. But there's one aspect which is still very difficult, which is the, the, the human ability to recognize an opportunity in a mistake. Yeah? Mm -hmm. uh, that's still something that is very, very hard to compute, if not impossible. 
Uh, and, and that I think is what Sandra was alluding a little bit to. Like when, when you, something comes out of the process, which might be ugly or different and you don't throw it away, but you rather see like what could be the potentiality of that piece, yeah, is something that is very, very hard to replicate with any sort of uh, neural network. If, I don't know if it's possible at all. This one, this one is the moment that I think um, Emmanuel was alluding to in terms of the human moment where you suddenly recognize the ability. And also this, this idea of serendipity that is there, that the possibility to see that, because you also need to recognize that serendipitous moment, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that serendipity okay. is finally uh, part with it. It's okay. quarter past. It's super rude that I have to leave with Sandra, yeah, but our students are already waiting. So like I invited all of you and then now I'm like, okay, bye guys, do whatever you want. I have to thank you very much for joining. Uh, uh, Neil is gonna take over and continue the conversation and I'm gonna look at it once it's getting replayed in the YouTube video. Yes, for everyone out there listening, these videos are gonna be repeated uh, in the YouTube channel, yeah. And thanks a lot, it was a great conversation and yeah, thanks a lot. Talk to you soon. Thank you and stay in touch. So I, I mean, just to, to um, clarify what I did, wasn't saying that the human should be completely out of the loop. What I'm suggesting is it's the same way we to relinquish that controlling urge to um, try and make AI do what we want it to do and open up the possibilities. It might, it might produce new approaches towards architecture like the game of Go. And I, I don't know, I think we have to be receptive to that possibility. Well, we have uh, the same discussion. Uh, Go ahead, sorry. No, uh, uh, the, the only thing, I mean, can, can I share the screen here? Yes, yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, okay. So, yeah, let me, so, you see it, right? Yeah. So, the thing is that, uh, we, uh, my feeling is that here we have a kind of a conservative viewpoint, you know, on architecture, because ultimately we, we, we speak about using AI to do uh, uh, like a uh, uh, more fancy um, uh, design or, or maybe more optimized or whatever. But we never really address the, the, the cultural relevance of the architecture at large. And my, my feeling is that what AI is really radically changing is precisely the relevance of architecture uh, uh, at the age of AI. You know, if we, if we consider what a car uh, is today, uh, a car is not this kind of traditional uh, uh, body anymore. I mean, of course, we could, we could make it sexy, we could have nice shapes, uh, uh, we, we, we could have it more streamlined or whatever, but nobody is interested in that in terms of, of the cultural relevance of, of, of a car, you, you see what I mean? Because, because this kind of cars, I mean, like, like sexy, fast, uh, big, etc. Uh, it's not culturally relevant in 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 this society anymore, and I, I think it's the same for for medicine. Uh, uh, it's clear that a certain kind of knowledge uh, uh, of doctors is not going to be relevant anymore. Uh, it's the same in biology. So basically, it's the same in in all disciplines. I mean, the traditional knowledge of some trader at the very moment is just completely useless if you put them uh, uh, on, a, uh, on a trading floor because I've, I mean they've been replaced by, by uh, algorithms. So my, my feeling is that really we should address the relevance of, of architecture in a much more radical way and, and it goes also with the relevance of the architect. Uh, you mentioned, Neil, uh, uh, I think rightly, the fact that maybe it's not relevant anymore to play Go because uh, uh, simply we know that some, some machines will, will uh, be better. So, but maybe, maybe Lee Seidel can be interested in writing algorithms so that uh, the artificial intelligence playing Go will become even better and even more fascinating. So if we look at what architecture is and what an architect is, my feeling is that it's not about uh, uh, using AI in a traditional way, you know, just like a kind of, of, of inspiring tool, uh, like a muse. Uh, personally, I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm not too much into that because I, I believe it's a very traditional position in, in architecture. I mean, architecture are already using Pinterest and all of, 
all of these things. So basically, my my position is that ultimately, uh, I by the way, I totally agree with you, Neil, about the fact that we should let the artificial intelligence do what what it wants, what it really wants, and and we should not try to compare this to our on traditional intelligence because it's not gonna work uh, and it's also a very conservative position. Uh, my feeling is that also working on the issue of shape, uh, using AI or not, is probably not very interesting neither uh, because as I'm showing here, uh, a, a CPU contains all possible architectures that could ever be invented by the next trillion generation of people. So in, in fact, I mean, just like coming up with a new building is not interesting anymore because there, there, there is a paradigm shift. Uh, and, you know, like for Duchamp, it was not so relevant anymore to do such or such a painting or a sculpture because he was really in search of something radically different. And I think this is what we have to do now at the age of AI. It's not about just like making uh, the same kind of painting painting with a slightly more sexy uh, uh, coloring or whatever. Uh, so uh, ultimately, and, and, and I, I, I'm going a bit, uh, a bit fast here, uh, of course, because uh, uh, I, I mean, it's a dialogue, uh, but I think artificial intelligence is bringing a, a, a fully new set of, of skills uh, that uh, are finally uh, made available to everyone and it's really changing what architects are because architects were specialists at some point. I mean, there are the guy who are the specialist of building, uh, how to design buildings, et cetera, et cetera. But it's not the case anymore. Probably architects are not, are not I mean, the, mo the, the, the person who, who will be the most expert in, in designing buildings because computers might be about that. You know, they, they might be like, sec like secretary. I mean, secretary were, were uh, uh, removed by the invention of world processing software. And uh, it's a job that really disappeared. And uh, I think we are speaking about AI here in a very traditional and almost romantic manner. But ultimately, I think, I, I, I really believe that AI make uh, most of the architects uh, totally uh, um, useless. Uh, and, uh, and this kind of architect, they will, they will simply disappear. So it's completely shifting upside down and, and, and putting things in a completely different order. You know, what is the importance of skills? What is the importance of genius? Uh, I'm not sure that architects are so relevant in architecture offices anymore, but uh, as I'm saying here, uh, if you want to create a company like Facebook, uh, you probably need some uh, really uh, crazy and exceptional people like uh, Mark Zuckerberg to, to do it. So, uh, Again, I mean, my final word on that is that AI is so amazingly radical and, and, and its efficiency is so amazingly radical that it's going to change things uh, uh, much more deeply than what we are discussing today when we discuss about style or, inspi or, 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 or inspiration uh, or, such a, or such a traditional uh, criteria. I completely agree. Thank you for that intervention. That was really, that was really wonderful. Maybe just, just to throw something out, since you mentioned the car, you know, almost like we're in a situation now with uh, Henry Ford had, you know, he said, ask people what they wanted and they'll say faster horses. You know, I think we need to have a, this kind of paradigm shift towards something um, th that is going to be more extreme. Having said all that, um, I should maybe acknowledge the fact that I'm I'm doing writing two books. I just finished one. I'm about to the second one, and I, I I find AI both exciting and terrifying. And so I've got one book about the, how amazing it is, and one book about how terrifying it is. And I've done the the, the first one, the, the amazing. Now the terrifying book, and the title is going to be the death of the architect. And I think in a way, um, 
and it's 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 a bit unfortunate in some sense, but but that's what it's going to lead to. Already, I think we're seeing that technology is displacing some people. We don't need so many people in the office because of that. But with AI, the initial phase, it's going to be this friendly assistant that's going to help us and expand our uh, possibilities. But ultimately, you know, it's going to because we're, we're talking about the, the exponential kind of increase in knowledge, the Moore's law or the law of accelerating returns. It's going to go racing ahead of us at some point. And, and you know, it's not it doesn't take a, a great feat of imagination to see that very soon it's it's going to know what we like already, like just as Spotify does, right? It knows our music and things. And actually, in the end, it will give us buildings that we like, and we don't. I mean, um, what's interesting about that? So in the end, it's going to be the the self-driving car analogy actually kicks in because uh, once you've got the self-driving car, you don't need the driver. Uh, and not only do you not need the driver, you probably find yourself in a situation whereby insurance premiums go up for the, for the driver uh, and, and people just can't afford to drive. So the, all these other kind of factors kind of kick in in some way. And, and you know, it'll, so uh, one of the comments I came across um, in this book called Machines That Think by Toby Walsh, he says, well, actually in the end, you know, uh, all cars will be self-driving cars and we won't, we won't really, re we really won't really mind. We won't recognize it. So what's going to happen, I think, is going to be like a like boiling a frog. It's going to go, uh, we won't notice the changes until suddenly we'll find that architects are redundant, which is um, no, unfortunate. No, but yeah, sorry, but I really have to disagree here, like 100%. But I think it's good for a discussion and people are watching. So I think we were, it's all a matter of time span. Uh, the kind of AI that was described before that you're describing does not exist. It, it just simply no. does not exist today. Oh, yeah. It's called yeah. AGI, and that's notion of artificial general intelligence. Um, certainly people on the West Coast in the US believe, people like Kurtzvale believe that it's coming, but it does not exist today. It's, it's, and it's not gonna come within the next 20 years. So um, we might, we are lucky to have new tools that are interesting and that make maybe some functions easier in our daily job. However, the notion of AGI is not gonna come across in the area of architecture before, before decades. Um, it, it's not me saying this, it's like, uh, there's a typical philosopher back in France called Ganassia was very clear, you know, f um, written books about this. What, what, what is at the heart of the discussion is not at all, I think, reality, meaning no, AGI is not here. What we've been discussing, I think, uh, for the last 20 minutes is more on the side of the myth. Um, it, and it's interesting, the AI is fueling a mythical discussion about this kind of nightmare of AI, it, it, it's, and it's an interesting discussion, but it's not anchored into any technical reality uh, since AGI is not here. And, and the most uh, you know, technically able people in the field of AI can absolutely back what I'm saying here, meaning that AGI myth um, is, is very much on the side of faith. It's a belief held by, yes, a handful of technicians. Um, but I think in architecture, if we, want, if we want really deeply to shape the discussion in architecture, we really need to move away from the myth understand that that nightmare is not going to come, but it's not within the next decades. Um, and that AGI is more, again, more of a myth, more of a long-term possibility, but not at all something that has come today. Maybe people on the panel want to correct me or disagree with me, uh, but certainly um, we, we, we should really strive to, to handle AI for what it is and not, not a myth no, coming in the future. We don't need it. We don't need, our, we don't need a, a general intelligence Exactly. to make the architect disappear. I mean, I yeah, mean, the level point. of AI at the very moment is far enough, far enough. I, I, I would say it's million times uh, 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 stronger and more powerful that, than what we really need in architecture to make the architect, the architect disappear. It's mostly a matter of the ecosystem. It's mostly a matter of the organization of works, etc. It's not a technical issue anymore. I mean, it's not a technical issue. It could disappear right from, I mean, today, you know? Uh, yeah, just to pick up on this also, I want to clarify, uh, um, Stanislav, I wasn't talking about AGI. So, I mean, just yeah. for those who don't know, AGI is when AI gets consciousness. And I know, will it ever get consciousness? I don't know. It doesn't matter though. And let me just take another uh, analogy from the car. Um, Yuval Harari talks about this and says, actually, sometimes consciousness is actually a problem. There was a, um, one of these uh, self-driving cars that, 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 that a, a human-driven car crashed into it. And uh, 
it was probably the fact that the human driver was distracted, was you know checking his cell phone or her cell phone or something, or thinking about something else. So in some senses, um, we don't need consciousness. I mean, that, that, why do we need consciousness? You know, and I think you, the, the universe will go on without human consciousness. So we need to step back. And that's what I'm saying about the second Copernican revolution. We've got to recognize that it doesn't depend on us, you know, and maybe it'll, something else will happen. So I, I'm not arguing for AGI at all. I'm just simply yeah. saying that, that it, it clearly has the capacity. If it knows what news we like, what, what music we like, what movies we like, it will know what architecture we like and it will be able to deliver it. Uh, with, with or without consciousness, it will be able to deliver it. But, but let's, let's see at what we have today uh, on the field. Uh, it, you said it will have, but they, I think one thing that lacks here is how will it? Because uh, unless we provide here the proof that it will one day, I won't believe it today. I won't have this, I won't commit to this kind of faith. And, and let's state what exists today. Um, the, the comparison with the self-driving car, uh, Thank God, we, we are lucky that architecture is harder than a, designing a self-driving car. The reason why we're amazed at a self-driving car is the immediacy of that technology. It's really hard because it, it has to be immediate and to work on the spot. Uh, sociology, demography, politics, things that are anchored, woven into architecture, are, it's, I would have it's harder to understand. I, I, I have to disagree here. Yes, please, go, I go have, ahead, Philip. I have to, to say that I totally disagree. How many, how many person, how many people with a, with, with a scientific level of Yann Le, of Yann Le Kuhn or, or uh, Joshua Bengio or, or how many thousands of, of really brilliant people in artificial intelligence are working in architecture offices today? You know, how many how many terabytes, or how many petaflops, how many petaflops of, of computing power are made available to architecture office today? It's not, I mean, it's not uh, uh, the difficulty of architecture. Architecture is primitive. I really insist on that. Architecture is primitive. You know why? Because at some point, you know, uh, uh, when you, you just turn a volume, I mean, you just shift the volume like that, and then most clients are super happy. They say, oh, that's really the kind of creativity that architects are, are capable of, and we would have never thought about that. But this is the most stupid, this is the most stupid formal manipulation you can ever imagine. And by the way, when you really do really like, like, like really top level world-class architecture, they, they don't understand it. <laughs> so, I, I, I mean, yeah, I so think, are, I, I, it's, it. again, it's a, it's a social problem. It's a political and it's a social problem. It's not a matter of neither of a, a difficulty nor a matter of technical, uh, uh, um, uh, sorry. Uh, yeah, I mean, architecture is easy. Let's keep this in mind. Yeah. <laughs> if I may, if and I may, we have, to, just, we have uh, to also think like, we are talking yeah. about probably this kind of architecture that we are saying that AI is not going to be able to produce. That's maybe five, ten percent of all the architecture that is created out there. You know, mm -hmm. but what's happening with the rest ninety percent? So ninety yeah. percent, like Philip is saying, it's mostly just boxes and moving. So on that in a way framework, actually, you can say, of course, AI is going to replace those things. Of course, an AI is going to be able even better, probably. Oh, it's going to end up being even better than those kind of stupid solutions. Yeah, we are going to have actually better quality and that on that domain, you know. Okay, but, but, then, but then if I may answer, uh, to, to, there were two points made. The first one was uh, self-driving cars are harder because talents today obviously are in self-driving cars company. That was one mm -hmm. argument made. The second one was sharing a box is an easy, an easy uh, transformation, an easy task. Therefore, it's way easier than making self-driving cars. On both cases, I want to answer on both things. The first one is talents being in several driving cars company. Um, it's a matter of, of the market. It's a matter of where capital is being invested. And those talents are being attracted because of the amount of cash being poured by VCs in those companies. We have a way, more, a way slower industry with smaller margins to be made. Therefore, we don't benefit from those capitals as much as, uh, as those uh, other industries do. And that's the precise point. Therefore, we don't attract the talents because, well, we don't have the capital and, let's say, the cash flows to pay those people. Uh, so I wouldn't look at talents and then assume it's easier to make buildings because the talents are not there. 
I think it's just a, that is just a matter of how the industry, those industries are shaped, not because of the task at stake. Back to the sharing of the box, um, that is only, and that's, I think it's typically something that we see today is we think of what building should be tomorrow based on what clients answer to us. But we should hold ourselves to higher standards. It's simply because we could aim higher. We could say the building should be better, not just based on what the markets want, but, for, but we should set a bar, a higher bar. And it's only if we decide that architecture should be that much better, not just at the level of the market or not just at the level of what the brief of the client is asking, but that much better. We said that because we think as a disciplinarian that there is a greater kind of architecture that awaits us in the future. If we do that, then therefore, then it's not a matter of just sharing a box. It's, it's way more complex. Making great architecture remains a really hard thing to do. Sharing a box talks to geometry, but also talks to sociology, talks to demographics, talks to politics, talks to all those sort of things that are so hard to do. And I would, I would still uh, assume way harder than have a car drive on the road because um, those things are woven into social sciences that are so complex, so hard to comprehend that therefore needs powerful, more powerful tools and, more, and harder methodologies. I, I, did I get the point across or is it a bit... A bit yeah, you know? but for me it's still... Uh, Sorry, guys, I, just need to, I just need to interrupt because uh, it's uh, half past 1 a.m. in Asia, so I'm kind of dozing mm -hmm. off. So I think I have to excuse myself. You guys yeah. could continue, but thanks a lot. Yeah, yeah. yeah. see you guys. Okay. Thank you, thanks. Uh, for me, in a way, as an architect, it's still, you know, like, um, I understand all these uh, uh, aspects that you're talking about and a um, um, certain level of quality that has to be and what we should dream of, you know, when it comes to architecture, what kind of standard needs to have. But I'm just thinking that mostly those standards, they apply to a very narrow, uh, just something like 10% probably of all architecture that is built today. So then for me, the question is, uh, I can focus on those 10% and I'm going to try to influence the rest of 90% of architecture being done by example in a way. Or I can choose this kind of very startup in a way, a mindset where I, what I'm doing, I'm iteratively in a way improving. So if you have an AI or multiple AIs that are for 80, 90% of architecture that's already being made very bad, yeah, very poorly, and you have an improvement of 20% or let's say of quality, it doesn't have to be perfect like socially or something, but it's already greater than whatever I can do in that 10%, you know? So for me, most of the time when I'm thinking about AI and taking over architecture or stuff like that, I'm thinking mostly about that side of architecture, not the side where we are trying actually to reach a certain super high quality, you know? You know? So I think on that kind of, uh, when I'm making that kind of calculation, when I'm saying, Actually, to have an AI design that kind of architecture, probably it's way better because right now we have, in a way, a lot of data to see that the architecture that is being made right now in that domain actually is very bad. Yeah, and I think AI is going to be able actually to do even better. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, just can I just throw something out there, and that is to say, you know, I'm not so sure. This may be echoing what Philippe was saying. I'm not so sure that we are so special as architects. You know, I think we we claim that we're green creative, um, yeah. but are we? You know, and I, you know, if, I, if I if I look at the kind of um, a typical review, you know, as an example, I always give with my students. You know, if 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 a student would come along and design a pineapple, someone would look at that and they'd say, "This and this is not architecture. Maybe you should be selling fruit or something like that." You know, but if you do a kind of building that is a little bit like Zaha or Herzog and or or Gary or foster or whatever, but tweak it slightly, you can't make it exactly the same, that's architecture. So in a sense, it's a bit like jazz, you know, you're, there's an existing pattern and rhythm and you're kind of doing a variation on that. Of course, not all architecture is like that. There are a few kind of game changing moments. I think we'd say that something like the Sydney Opera House might've been one. I'd say that Gary's Bilbao would have been, would have been one. I would say also that maybe that uh, um, uh, Thomas Heatherwick's um, uh, British Pavilion in, in Shanghai 2010, that was kind of like a pineapple, right? And they're kind of things that change the name of the game. But on the whole, we're pretty conventional, you know? And I think that's a real, that's a problem, you know? And that's why I think AI could come in and radically change what we think it is, like the game of Go changed. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. I think that that's where, where actually uh, you look for the change. Uh, because I think uh, the architects that are already doing uh, high quality architecture, 
I don't think they are going to have really a problem like AI replacing them or something because they are, they are really going to find like ways to actually even create even greater architecture than what they are creating right now. But I think but, that the, the question is overall, yeah? Yes, yeah, but yes, the, 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 just to say, I, I'm not quite sure that Philippe and, and Stanislav uh, realize that behind Daniel, the, the image no. he's got behind him, is the example yes. of the Himmelblau, which is in a sense, completely AI generated. So, you know, in a way, you know, I think even the progressive firms will be using that. Um, I know that uh, Tom Main and Wolf Pricks will be in a discussion about this um, fairly soon, but Patrick Schumacher also, they're kind of thinking about how you use AI in a certain sort of way. So um, it's, it's already there. I mean, just to kind of comment also, but there was a, a study done by the, the um, RIBA a few years ago, um, Building Futures, a, a group that I used to belong, belong to a long time ago. And they produced this report um, where basically they were saying that even the word architect was going to go out of fashion fairly soon because it wasn't very useful. And, and, and they, were, they were looking at the, 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 the kind of landscape and, and the star architects, the star architects were the ones who were going to survive because their signature buildings, they become like a brand name but everyone else was going to suffer in some ways. And, and uh, th that report was kind of repressed after a while when they realized it was kind of negative, but I think that's the way we're going to go. Um, and probably, I think a lot of it will be AI generated st standard stuff and there'll be a few signature architects who will be using AI also in a different way to go and open up the kind of the, the palette of possibilities. And I think also I mean, the star architects, they are going to benefit in a way from having AI generated in a way uh, this kind of uh, low quality, let's say lower quality uh, architecture, they are going to benefit from that because the amount of information that they can gather and, you know, uh, develop further their AI is simply immense, you know. So, I, I, I think one of the good examples is the taxi drivers. I mean, with, with Waze and Uber uh, put together, anybody can become a taxi driver. I mean, I mean, you you know, it's, it's legendary difficult to be a taxi driver in London because you have a very difficult exam and, and, and there's a lot of, of uh, I mean, you more or less need to know all of the streets of London, which is a mess. Uh, I mean, it doesn't make a difference anymore, you know? I mean, uh, it's, a use, it's a completely useless knowledge. And I think this example about a taxi driver is something which, which architects have to uh, to, to think about, uh, because a large part of the knowledge of the architects is not much, not more advanced than just knowing the name of the streets of London, which is a completely useless knowledge. Yeah, no, maybe I, I can mean, speak. architecture. Architecture is a very strange discipline, you know, because it's at the same time very basic, and at the, and and it might be also infinitely difficult. Uh, because, I mean, obviously, if it was not so difficult, we would have like hundreds of thousands of Frank Gehry, hundreds of thousands of Peter Eisenman and Norman Foster, etc. And as a matter of fact, we don't have hundreds of thousands of Gehry, Eisenman and Foster. So it's clearly a very difficult discipline at a certain level. But for most of the architecture, which is practi practiced today, uh, it's very basic and the constructions are very basic and the construction techniques are very basic. So uh, again, I, I think we should not underestimate the, uh, the future impact of AI on the world discipline of architecture uh, because I think it's, it's going to be really, really radical. And uh, it's nice that we discuss AI in terms of shape, uh, what I mean, what it can bring for really like eye, eye architecture, which is the equivalent of eye art. Uh, mm. but, but, you know, when you do eye architecture and eye art, in any case, you don't care about uh, the, optimi the optimization of your layout. I mean, that's not the kind of thing you are interested in, in your, if you are a uh, uh, Wolf Pricks or, or uh, Frank Gehry. And, yeah, and, I mean, I think that's your, cool. that it's your service. Uh, no, uh, Neil, just, I just want to make one point here is that it, it, it is true that we will be automated really easily by AI if we consider our, ourselves as only providing a service. Let's not forget that not too long ago, we were providing a service and carrying the risk of the construction. Only there, because we were carrying the risk of the construction for years to come, the, only then we were making actual 
better money than what we are doing today because we sell ourselves as a service. Um, but we were more relevant and more contributing and more present in the debate. Um, one th let me just propose an alternate scenario here. Instead of us fading out due to AI because we see ourselves as a service, what about reclaiming that responsibility that we used to carry because we can predict the performance and people, society will be interested in us carrying the risk because, and, and we will be able to carry that risk because we can predict the performance. Um, th that is an alternate scenario where instead of fading away, well, we just come back at the middle of the table because suddenly we have those tools to forecast the risk and to, to assist the risk profile of a practice. Um, th th does this uh, ring um, bell? Or but in, the, in this way, in this kind of scenario, is the risk, uh, who's taking the risk? Is the architect or the company that is providing the AI that creates the prediction and the assessment and everything? Could I just pick, just pick up on the comment that um, Philippe's comments, I, I really enjoyed your intervention, Philippe, but I just want to say that maybe the taxi is maybe the wrong model because Taxis mm -hmm. are being phased out now. You know, we're talking now about, you know, uh, hailing Uber, um, whatever, the other sort of forms of, 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 um, of operation. And I think the problem with architects when it, they come to deal with these, these, this new world is they keep thinking in terms of form. So I, the problem I have with Mario Carpo, he talks about big data and he thinks there's a kind of new architectural style of big data. But the point about big data is not about form, it's about information. It's the way that the, the taxi now operates because actually a taxi is no different. I mean, an Uber car is no different to an ordinary car precisely because it is an ordinary car, right? It's straightforward. It's just the operation, the informational systems that are so different. And I, that's the world we, we, we need to think as architects, instead of thinking, what's the new sexy style of architecture, to think about how we can harness this intelligence in terms of informational systems. But then it results in a different business model, because I agree with you, it's a revolution of information, but what it informs, it's a new way to practice, meaning a business model. Uh, to, to the question that you just asked before, who will carry the risk? Well, it simply means to redefine the business model. Uh, mm -hmm. We won't be carrying the same kind of risk. Maybe it's a way for us to turn our back and to look at insurance company and convince them to back us on certain deal, on certain construction. Maybe the, the radicality, maybe the revolution really comes from the business model that will be associated to AI. Maybe there's a new way to shape the risk profile and to convince investors to follow us in certain endeavors. Um, that, is, that would be new. There's no template here. We won't go back to what we used to be in the past. We won't stay as a service, because if we remain simply a service, we will fade away, that's a given. Then therefore, because as you say, Neil, it's a revolution of information, that informs a new type of business model. L let's define it. I think um, in the US, IPD br brought something on the table that was really interesting. There are new ways to think of ourselves within AEC, with a relationship to the client, the contractor, and the engineer. If there's a way for us to bring investors and to bring insurance companies and to show them that we know our risk for the first time we can maybe forecast it yeah just to kind of say i mean just i don't want to take the conversation but there is ai actually is used now in risk assessment i mean autodesk in a kind of maybe straightforward way but they're using ai in terms of risk assessment and that's actually kind of useful if you just think of the way that you know you now if you've got a zoom meeting you can remind it about these things automatically and you could imagine how risk is then flagged up in that sort of way so no i, I completely agree i completely agree yeah and for sure you know like uh what was is i imagine the same like uh sometimes i was saying you know in the end it's a, a matter of business models and how exactly because we are not going to be any more architects like we define ourselves today it's going to be completely different it's going to be a different model different way of doing architecture. So yeah, yeah I, I agree with that, yeah. Yeah, I think just, I mean, in a way, because this is a comment I also make often, is, is to say that, you know, the one thing that architects, uh, they're design, we're designers, right? But the one thing we haven't designed is our own future. And I think that's where we've got to really focus right now is trying to think about what role we have and how to be inventive about how to find a space for ourselves. Yeah. Absolutely, could not agree more. Yeah. No, I, um, I will have to also uh, sign out soon. Sorry? So it, I will have to sign out soon. Because I okay, well, let's we go for another 10, 12, 40 minutes with like three wheels on my wagon. Let's just keep going because I think this is a super interesting conversation. I'm very pleased to be able to talk to Stanis off the first time ever. And Felipe is, um, yeah. Um, so, uh, um,
No, I, I just, I, I, I think that there's a, there's a new model coming out and we've got to sort of adapt or perish, you know, and I think there, it's not, it's not simply that we can go and start designing other things. I, in a way, the AD that Ben Asferay and I, I produced a few years ago, uh, we called it 3D printed body architecture, um, precisely because we noticed that people like Neri Oxman and so on, were, and Niccolo Casas and so on, were working, designing 3D uh, outfits for the fashion industry, for people like Iris van Herpen and so on. And, and what became very clear is that we have these set of skills that, that, that are very marketable. We can shift into other design domains. In many ways, the, the silos that used to exist about what was architecture and so on is all gone. And now we're in this kind of um, horizon where we, um, we can do other things. But at the same time, I think those other disciplines are also going to be suffering. So we're like jumping out of one, um, uh, one sort of life raft into another in the mm -hmm. sense that that's also going to be suffering. Um, so it, it requires a fundamental shift in, in, in thinking, the, the, the kind of Henry Ford model, you know, everybody thought it should be this, uh, to really take us further, further forward. But I think that's really vitally important. But, but that's where maybe there's a race that is starting today. Uh, if, if, if what you're saying is true, uh, that if we are able to adapt and change and therefore embrace new disciplines. Um, that's very much the case today. I mean, things are shifting in architecture, that's for sure. But the one race that's starting today uh, is the race towards who will own the ontology, who will own the understanding or will craft the ontology. The ontology meaning like this kind of wireframe onto that will be the, the general model onto which all those AI models will be plugged somehow. Uh, there's an analogy to make things very clear. Uh, there's Palantir, which is a really well-known company that has disrupted the consulting world and suddenly is competing against BCG, McKinsey, Bain, and others. Um, one thing they've done, which is very interesting, is that they have structured uh, pre-existing practices but flipped it into a notion of ontology. They've basically defined what's the greatest schema onto which we can plug all the arsenal of AI models and tools. Um, Palantir's approach is, is fascinating because they've built up what they call, you know, the experience curve. They have built this ontology and then they, it's kind of a wireframe, a mattress on which they weave every day more expertise, more knowledge. And that's what they, makes them able to compete against, well, you know, BCG and all players. So going back to our fields, this notion that people will define a core ontology, will define this kind of um, wireframe onto which every single AI model will, will be integrated, added, plugged, um, is very much something that actually I started today. So tech companies are running to this. Autodesk is running to define this. Other companies that were outside of our industry are running to define this for us. Um, but, but the good thing is that as architects, we understand what is relevant to be encoded in that ontology. Um, so if parametricism was the thing yesterday where, where we would simply define in our own office tiny scripts, parametricism, well, today, the big deal for us is semanticism, defining the semantics of that ontology, crafting that, that mattress, that, that frame, so that we kind of own with others. It doesn't need to be only architects, but at least we have to be in the debate. We are, we are into this, this discussion of what should be the wireframe, the, the mattress, on which all those AI things get plugged and integrated. Um, I, I want to bring this up because let's be aware that Behind this discussion, while we were talking, people are actively working on this. And um, there's a sense of urgency, of course, to train ourselves and to, and to come to the table and discuss this. Because if that happens without us, then yes, for sure, we will be bypassed. I mean, I think, yeah. I think it's a, sorry, Dan, uh, yeah. sorry. No, I, I, go ahead. I just want to say like, um, uh, because I'm also having this kind of concern in a way that in the end, you know, we might end up with just one single AI. And uh, personally, you know, I would love to see a future where actually we still have a form of architects, maybe not exactly what they are today, but to have a form of architect that, you know, it has this kind of uh, AIs like uh, in their workflows. And then I would imagine in a way this kind of ecology almost like self-organization between multiple AI that are dealing with uh, architecture, you know, that will be for me a, a scenario where also this kind of aspect of not being conservative, but starting to actually, you know, come up with new ideas because most of the time, also the way we operate, the way we learn certain things from other architects are is very similar and then in a way provokes in us different maybe uh, new novel solutions. So I'll imagine that, but, uh, I'm, I'm a bit uh, afraid of this kind of thing that you're also seeing in Stanis Lab when uh, actually you have this kind of big companies that are going to monopolize in a way uh, 
who has data and then is enabling, uh, mostly you are going to operate just with that data. Yeah? So it's going to be like just two, three AIs that are quite, you know, quite static, let's say. Uh, and then uh, from there, it's, it's very easy then to see a feature where it, architecture is very conservative. It's just the same kind of results or something. Yeah. Yeah. Just one thing I wanted to add to this, this conversation is a kind of comment. And that is that we, we were talking with architects talking among architects, right? And, and I think there's a real danger in architectural circles of people, of architects overvalorizing their importance, of thinking that we're mm -hmm. hugely important. You know, I, I, I kind of, I once at a conference once I said, well, actually we're, we're a bit like hairdressers. You know, you go to your hairdresser and you say, <laughs> I want to walk back and sides and we just do it for the client, right? You know, and, and in the end, we're at, the, we're at the end of a chain. We're not in charge at all. All we can do at best with, a, with the only, I mean, people, like architects, I think they're very powerful political animals. All we can do is perhaps persuade the client to maybe use more sustainable materials or something like that. We have no say, you know, and, and what I'm, I'm concerned about, it's going to be the kind of the, the developer clients who are calling the tune. And we, unless we adapt to that, we're going to be ren rendered redundant because, you know, I, well, the example I always use is, you know, when I was a student at Cambridge, I would, I would, I'd go on vacation, I'd go to, to travel agents and I would sit and queue up and get my ticket, right? And then I'd go along to a camera shop and I would buy a, a, a series of rolls of films and then I'd go and holy, come back and I'd get the films processed. All those industries have almost disappeared, right? Almost, the, the, there are a few travel agents, but, you know, camera shops have, have closed down because of, cell phones and things and we don't develop films anymore so whatever we're brought up with to think they should be there forever we may not we not may be there forever at all unless we adapt and think and think um, imaginatively about our future um, and i would uh, oh no sorry no go, go on uh, stanislas if you want no 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 Philippe, it's fine i'll add my thing next okay uh no i uh, regarding the the uh, the ontology and the semantics uh, right. Uh, partially, partially, it's true that uh, architects are probably uh, uh, the best in understanding what architecture is really about. I I cannot agree with that. Um, but you know, if you look at what happened for uh, automatic translations, for example, uh, we thought we thought that linguists would be the guy who would solve automatic translation problems. But it didn't happen like that. I mean, automatic translation didn't get better because of linguists. It got better because of pure mathematicians. Uh, and those mathematicians, for example, they, they saw, I mean, they identified similarities between different languages. And those similarities were amazingly abstract. They were pure mathematical similarities in a multidimensional space. And then they could identify that, that such or such a language were behaving in the same way, mathematically speaking, again, uh, uh, in, in a very high dimensional space. And the linguist, they could do very little about that. I mean, the traditional linguist could not compete with the level of abstraction that was necessary to make uh, uh, automatic translation become what, what, what it became, you know? So this is why, again, I, I believe that maybe at the very moment, uh, the knowledge of architects in ontology uh, is relevant. But still, I would be a bit more skeptical and not so optimistic uh, about that because I'm not, to, I'm not really convinced that this knowledge of the architect in architectural ontology is so useful ultimately. And my feeling is that in a couple of years, we will have such great advancements and progress in artificial intelligence again, even if we don't go towards uh, artificial general intelligence. Uh, and this progress will be far enough so that uh, even the notion of architectural ontology won't be necessary anymore. So, um, so I think to, to everyone who's listening, I think Philip's point is a really good point. Um, the question of uh, expertise and relevance uh, is really a key thing. And uh, Philippe, I could not agree more, uh, meaning uh, even if uh, Ferdinand Saussure created semanticism in, 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 you know, some time ago, uh, Google created with the most powerful expression of what semantic search can be. 
Um, and so, so I could not agree more. Uh, so that, that is a call for us to talk to others. Uh, we can't be siloed anymore. We can't just be among ourselves. We, there's no other way for us than to open up the discipline and talk to other people. Um, that, that, is, that is a given, of course. But again, social exists. And Google search engine without social would not be a thing. Um, there's, we have the chance to have, and, 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 and the second thing is Saussure theorized way before Google ever happened. One thing that can happen for us, is we could be, it could be as if Saussure had existed at the same time as Google. We could theorize those ontology and see them happen in the same lifetime almost, because the technology is here actually. Uh, tech companies are really having a hard time at finding those ontologies and their underlying structure. So something that could be very satisfying for our generation of architects is within time span of 20 to 30 years, being able to lay down the rightful ontologies that, would, that could describe architecture in some sense and see them happen as we define them. Because again, the technology already exists, knowledge graphs are already around. Um, there's something exciting about that. Um, but your point is the right one. Uh, competency, expertise uh, is, is paramount. And we won't do it on our own, that's a given. Um, but again, those people exist. Uh, and we do have some amount of technical knowledge as architects that we can use to, to catalyze a discussion with the, te the, the technicians. Um, so hope remains, mm -hmm. or at least I hope. <laughs> but, uh, uh, Neil, Neil uh, spoke about Mario Carpo. Uh, before mm -hmm. with the big data and uh, and for that I have to say I totally agree with Mario when he says that specifically probably the most radical thing with the big data is that we don't need science in a traditional way and science in a traditional way is also based on laws and also based on, on, on ontologies and these kind of things so yeah. uh, it's true that maybe ultimately it's not a matter of style uh, but, you know, if style happens, it's simply because ultimately architecture remain a classical and partly an artistic discipline. So as long as we, 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 we are uh, a part of an artistic discipline, uh, mm -hmm. the issue of style will happen even if, if some architect like myself are not so interested in, in, in style, you know. Uh, yes. But... I would say it's something w which which is almost a kind of side effect. Even if I mean some architects are more or less interested in style, but ultimately it's a side effect. So, uh, mm -hmm. but the key thing is that uh, with big data, um, and again, uh, I'm not 100% convinced with the issue of ontology uh, on big data and and. I mean, thanks, thanks to that, you can have a multiplicity of models. You can put many different data coming from uh, uh, having very different qualities. Uh, you can put all of that together. And to be honest, nobody really understands why it works so well, you know, sometimes. But the very fact, I mean, the fact is that it works and it works extremely well. So uh, having this ontological view, uh, yeah, I'm not, I'm not 100% sure. I mean, uh, uh, at, uh, you know, like uh, a couple of months ago before the, uh, the lockdown, there was this exhibition at uh, the Centre Pompidou about the brain, about, mm -hmm. um, I mean, neurons. And I think this was very interesting because, because this exhibition was very much dedicated to to the complexity of, of brain theory, uh, of the fact that all this issue of the mechanization of thought is a very mm -hmm. key uh, issue today. Uh, and it was also trying to, uh, uh, to reassess all the, uh, all the discourse uh, which were at the, let's say, at the interface of, of pure mathematics, uh, uh, algorithmics, computer science, uh, uh, mechanics, you know, uh, and I think this is probably what we have to do today. I, uh, uh, we have to go into that in a much more, again, in a much more radical way. At the very moment, what I'm a bit afraid of is that most architects are, are users of technology, you know, like people using smartphone, 
uh, like architects you who who, uh, uh, who, you, who were users of uh, AutoCAD, uh, Rhino, Grasshoppers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I believe that if we keep doing that, there's no future for architects. Yes, this this I can completely agree. We need to get out of of being just users of technological solutions. That's absolutely, but. Maybe that's for me the opportunity to reinforce this idea of ontology simply because at least that's it's a it's two things at the same time. It's a place where we are absolutely relevant to talk because we have a good sense of how it could look like. And second thing, it's also a necessary thing for uh, those AI models to actually m be useful in our world. Uh, we need to have a, a complete exhaustive uh, modelization of architecture to then plug those models onto them so that they become relevant because they can target specific tasks. Without that um, you know, underlying mattress onto which we plug all those technical solution, it would never grow beyond what Grasshopper used to be. You know, each architect has, has his, his own script on his own computer, but there is no broader knowledge being produced. Um, this broader knowledge can exist, can happen if we create that ontology. And again, let's not forget People are starting to work on this. Actually, it's it's something that is on the way, um, and we, we do have the chance to shape that. Um, if but if we start if we start today, um, so we, we unfortunately we're going to have to yes. wrap this up now. We just I just want to make a comment there on on Philippe. I mean the comment about the brain that seems to be central. We had a discussion yesterday with Anil Seth about, uh, um, and Refik Anadol about AI and neuroscience. What was interesting was Anil Seth um, studied AI and then became a neuroscientist. There are plenty of examples of, of other people, you know, starting off as, as, as neuroscientists and moving into AI. And in fact, actually, there's a famous comment that's made by Alan Turing, who says that I'm more interested in how the brain works and actually than using computers as such. So in some ways, I think it comes together in that kind of issue. And I, the, the initial um, term artificial intelligence was, it was kind of, was coined back in 1952 or something like that. But the comment, well, the time was actually, it's really about intelligence. The term artificial is maybe kind of missing the point here. And I think that, you know, I think that's what we need to open up to is the notion of, of how intelligence can come in form architecture in a, in a kind of new way, um, an architectural intelligence, shall we say. Um, guys, uh, thank you so much for this. This has been great. I, you know, I feel like I've, I've had such an interesting conversation with Philippe before on, on a few days, two days ago, and to, to talk to Stanislav has been fantastic, and, and Daniel also. So let's hope this is just not the end of something, but the beginning of a continued conversation. And thank you so much for your time. I'm really touched by how you've given your time generously. And I'm hoping that the audience around the world has been, has been appreciating this. I certainly have been appreciating it. So thank you so much. And uh, let's hope we meet again sometime soon. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank thanks you. a lot. And thanks for all your organization also uh, to Philip, Philip Yuan. And, you know, I mean, it's an amazing organization, amazing event. Thanks. But I will just say one thing, that was an example of the architectural imagination in operation, thinking about systems yeah. more than just simply buildings. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.